to Quincy Historical Society. I see quite a few returning faces. Welcome back to every one of you. And I see quite a few new faces here as well, so welcome if you're here for the first time. Um, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Alexandra Elliott. I am the curator here at Quincy Historical Society. If you are here tonight and you decide that you really like us, please consider becoming a member. Uh, if you are not one already, that is how you get all of the uh, communications about when we have upcoming programs and all sorts of interesting things that are going on. At this point, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Professor Marianne Holdscombe. So Marianne is a professor at Kennesaw State University, uh, associate professor of American history, I believe. Yes, that is correct. I remembered it without having to look. That's fabulous. Uh, and actually, this program has been a long time coming. Back in 2021, I believe, Marianne emailed us, uh, I believe in the summer, and saying, I'm coming to Quincy, I'm researching for a book about John Adams and how he is remembered by our country. And Ed and I immediately said, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Uh, this sounds like a fantastic project. This will be a fabulous conversation. And unfortunately, I was not able to be present for it because I was serving on a jury at the time. Uh, but Ed told me all about it after I got back and said that it had been a fantastic conversation. They talked about all the monuments here in Quincy, all of the plans for commemorating John Adams. Uh, and Marianne was very generous in her book with the amount of space that was dedicated to uh, Quincy, in fact. So there are, t in fact, two whole chapters dedicated to how Quincy uh, commemorates and remembers John Adams, which is you know, you know, something that we don't get a lot of uh, rec recognition for uh, most of the time. So we were, we were very delighted to, to find that after the, uh, when the book finally was published. Um, so this quickly became a very uh, cordial relationship uh, between Marianne and Ed and myself. Uh, we were chatting all the time, and when the book was finally published, we said we have to find a way to get you up here and do a book talk and a book signing here at the Historical Society, because it, this has to happen uh, after the fact. And so finally, we were able to do so, and on John Adams' birthday, no less. Uh, for those of you who attended the John Adams presidential wreath laying earlier today at the Church of the Presidents, Marianne was actually one of the keynote speakers, uh, and then, and now she is uh, gracious enough to speak for us here tonight as well. So please uh, well, join me in welcoming to Quincy Historical Society, Professor Marian Holtzcomb. Good evening, everybody. I um, have to start by thanking Ed Fitzgerald and Alexandra Elliott um, their support of this project from the very beginning has meant so much to me, and making this talk happen was just incredibly generous of them. They have been wonderful. I consider them colleagues and now friends, so thank you so much. And thanks to, yeah. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for coming out on this rather raw, rainy night. Um, Today, we are celebrating the 288th birthday of John Adams. He's looking really good for his age. And I am so happy to be here commemorating the date of his birth with all of you in this town that he loved so much. Um, every time I come to Quincy, I feel like I found my people. Um, so I am just so, so very honored to be here. Um, my talk this evening is called Remembering My Favorite Founder from Strangely Used to the Usable John Adams. I'll be explaining that as I go through tonight. Let me just explain this phrase, my favorite founder. Um, who knew you could have a favorite founder? Like a favorite color or a favorite piece of music or a favorite movie. But what I've discovered with the advent of social media is that people do have favorite founding fathers. And sometimes it's the usual suspects. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and nowadays, dare I say it in Quincy, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I've also noticed on sites that are dedicated to remembering presidents or sites that are trying to get a monument built in Washington, D.C. to John Adams, 
that people will chime in and say, John Adams is my favorite founder. And I've started looking at that and thinking, I'm not alone. This is wonderful. <laughs> so let me just begin by telling you how this happened for me. Um, one of the questions I get all the time is, why John Adams? And it's usually not even that neutral. Sometimes it comes out, why John Adams? <laughs> and I've started answering that question with a question. Why not John Adams? So, um, I, because I just don't understand why I have to explain this to people. But um, for me, it all began during the bicentennial in 1976. I was between my eighth grade and my freshman year in high school. And I was eating up all the bicentennial stuff. I was a history nerd from a very young age, thanks to Captain Kangaroo. Maybe some of you remember him. Um, and I had great history teachers in school. So thank you to all of them for bringing me where I am. And in the summer of 1976, one of the broadcast networks showed the film version of the musical 1776. Now, I'd never heard of this musical. I wasn't familiar with the music. I wasn't familiar with the concept at all. I just knew I had to see it. It sounded like something I would really like. And from the very beginning of that movie, I was hooked. Now, for those of you who have not seen the film version of 1776, it begins differently than the stage version does. Um, John Adams is up in the bell tower of the Pennsylvania State House, um, and according to the script writers, he liked to go there to think. So he's up there all by himself. And the congressional custodian comes upstairs to try to find him, and the custodian says to him, Mr. Adams, Congress is ready to vote on a very important issue and they can't do that without you there. And the first words out of John Adams' mouth in the film are, I can just imagine. Okay, what burning issue are we voting on this time? There was something about the humanity that came out of that and the way William Daniels delivered that line, that, well, it had a two-pronged effect on me. First of all, I became a big, big fan of William Daniels. Still is, he's alive and well, and yes, I sent him a copy of the book and I haven't heard anything from him. So, if any of you know William Daniels, get him on track there. Um, but the other thing that happened was, I need to know more about John Adams. This is a guy that I can relate to somehow. He drew me in. And I was especially taken when what happened next happened in the film. Because Andrew McNair explains, well, they're voting on whether to require the Rhode Island militia to wear matching uniforms. <laughs> John Adams loses it at this point. He rushes downstairs and he gives this famous opening speech from the musical. He says, I have come to the conclusion that one man is called a disgrace that two are called a law firm, and that three or more become a Congress. <laughs> and by the way, it's interesting that you can find that quote um, on Facebook memes and on t-shirts attributed to John Adams. There's no evidence that he ever said it or that he ever wrote it. It's a creation of Peter Stone, but it's been attributed to him because of that musical. So that's the power of, of this, this piece of popular culture. So as the musical went on, I thought, this is a very human guy. This, this is a person who I can really relate to. And from that moment to this, I've tried to read everything I can on John Adams. I've been protective of him. I've tried to tell people what he has contributed. And it's safe to say that, that 1776 led directly to remembering John Adams for me. It took me 47 years, but I finally got it accomplished. And there are a lot of detours along the way. That's a, another story for another day. But that's how John Adams became my favorite founder. 
And I started thinking too, as I was reading about him and seeing him in more biographies, I wanted to figure out how it is that we are remembering John Adams. I didn't want to write just a straight biography. Lots of people have done that, including David McCullough. I mean, you know, I'm not going to compete with that. So I thought, I want to look at how he has come down through history, how his, his characterizations have changed. And he pops up in popular culture more than you might think. So that's what I set out to do with this book. I wrote the manuscript, sent it off, um, and we have to have our books peer reviewed in academe. So one of the outside readers mentioned that it would be interesting to put John Adams into the concept of what we call a usable past. And I was intrigued by this concept and so I began researching it a little bit. Um, the term, a usable past, did not come from a historian. It actually came from um, a literary critic who was writing in the early 20th century about the sorry state of American literature. And he was discussing how writers really didn't have a past, an American past, from which they could draw for inspiration. So he said, what we have to do then is create a usable past. Um, his exact quote was, we can discover, invent a usable past. So that's where the concept came from. And historians, of course, picked up on that and ran with it. And it kind of feeds into this idea of history and memory, that there are things that are happened that happen, that's, that's the history, and then the way we remember them, the way we interpret them is how we use that history. Um, sometimes when I'm talking to students about this, I'll use the term cafeteria history. Where we just go through the line and we pick what means something to us and leave the rest alone. It happens every day. And sometimes people aren't aware that that's what's happening. If we're talking about then a usable past and how we remember things, I got to thinking, well, historical figures can also be usable. So in the book then, I talk about a usable John Adams. How has John Adams been used over the years? What characteristics about John Adams come out um, and are dominant? over time. And those have changed somewhat. Some of them have not changed at all, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. One of the great joys, however, of being a John Adams scholar is that when you need a quote, you can find one. I mean, the man said just about everything about anything. So, um, my dear sweet John Adams provided me with a quote. In March of 1797, John Adams was writing home to Abigail, who was still here in Quincy. And he had just been inaugurated to the presidency. So this was kind of new territory for him. He's facing an uphill battle of following George Washington in the presidency. And he was trying to sum up what had happened that day and a few days before that. Um, he'd written a farewell message to the Senate, a group of people with which he had an uneasy relationship with, to say the least. And then he talked about his inaugural address. And he said to Abigail, and you can see him struggling in this letter, he said, I have ventured to say things, the word say and the word things, both capitalized. Um, given his experience as vice president, given his sometimes hostile relationship with the Senate, he also said, I have been prepared for what he called scoffs and sarcasms. But then he wrote, I have been so strangely used in this country, so belied and so undefended that I was determined to say some things. Now that's not all the quote. I'm going to leave the rest of the quote for later. Believe me, it's worth the wait.
But when I read that, I thought, there it is. Thank you, John, for giving me the quote that I needed. And so I began to think about how John Adams has been strangely used and the many different ways that he has been used in history and in memory. One of the first things that comes out about John Adams, and if you read biographies, you're going to see this over and over and over again, is that he's been neglected by history. So the neglected John Adams is where we start. And this is a refrain, interestingly enough, that goes from the early biographies in the 1930s, clear through David McCullough's work in 2001. Um, for example, Gilbert Chenard um, wrote a biography in 1933. I'll talk a little bit more about um, the theme of that book. And he was puzzled by the neglect of John Adams because he said, America is supposed to be this egalitarian place made up of common people. So why are we putting Thomas Jefferson and George Washington up on a pedestal and ignoring John Adams? He said John Adams was unsung, a distant and lonely figure in American history. When I read that line, my visual imagination started going, and I could just see the pantheon of the Founding Fathers over here and John Adams over in a corner kind of kicking at the, <laughs> the floor with his hands in his pocket, wondering why he was being neglected. But this is the first time that, that you really hear a biographer saying, you know, th this man should grab our attention because he's what America is all about. Now, a few years later, in 1976, um, a scholar named Peter Shaw wrote a book called The Character of John Adams. And it's part biography, part psychoanalysis. Uh, Peter Shaw was interested in getting at the personality of John Adams. And he noted that John Adams has a hard time getting the kind of attention you might want. He said, and I quote, one exception was typical of Adams' bad luck with publicity. Ezra Pound, who found a version of his own cranky originality in Adams, devoted one of the longest and least known sequences in American poetry to him in his cantos. Um, now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ezra Pound. Um, when John Adams wrote, you're never alone with a poet in your pocket, I don't think he had Ezra Pound in mind. <laughs> Be that as it may, Ezra Pound liked um, that John Adams concentrated on balance in government, and this was something that Pound himself was interested in. So a portion of his massive cantos is dedicated to John Adams. But going along with this whole idea of neglect, um, one of the literary critics who talks about Ezra Pound's Adams Cantos says that the Adams Cantos is in the most neglected portion of the whole Cantos. So, you know, there he is, again, being neglected. Fast forward to 2001 and David McCullough. Now, David McCullough's take on this was just a little bit different. Um, he was talking in an interview about why he chose to write his biography of John Adams. And he said that originally he was hoping to write a dual biography of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. But his fear was that Thomas Jefferson was going to outshine John Adams. What he discovered, however, is that John Adams became more interesting to him. And so that's why he chose to write about John Adams. So maybe that's not so much neglect as it is John Adams just can't live up to the glimmer and the shine of a Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps it's semantics. <laughs> and perhaps it's also about wanting to understand him. So maybe it's not so much neglect as it is looking for a way to understand who this man was. Now, if you really want to do that, the place to go is his papers. And this brings me to the next theme, the transparent John Adams. 
For a very long time, uh, the Adams family had been very protective of the Adams papers. And uh, Charles Francis Adams, his grandson, did publish some of John Adams' papers. Um, you can read the John Adams' works, but they're highly edited. Um, there were things that Charles Francis thought the people didn't really need to read. So uh, they're, they're highly edited. But um, in the 1950s, the Massachusetts Historical Society, um, in conjunction with the family, decided to publish these papers. And they made a big deal out of the publications. And once those papers came out, we got to see a whole other side to John Adams. Now, there's an upside to this, and there's a downside. The positive is that anything you might want to know about John Adams, he wrote it down. From constitutions to manure, he wrote about it. Um, and he loved to write about manure. Um, this was, he, was, he was proud of his manure. He compared his manure to English manure. I mean, he, he just talked about manure a lot. Um, but more than that, his observations of the times and of the people he was working with are just gold. Um, I always tell my students, if you want a sense of what it was like for these guys to get together at the First Continental Congress in 1774, look no further than John Adams' diary. It's beautiful. Not only does he talk about all of the meals that he's eating and how incredible it is that Philadelphia is on a grid, okay. um, <laughs> he also has all of these wonderful descriptions of his colleagues. And you get to know these people through John Adams' eyes. So if you've never had a chance to just sit down and read that portion of his diary, I highly recommend it. The downside is that this will open John Adams up to a good deal of scrutiny. He's put under a microscope the way other founders are not. And other founders, like George Washington, like Thomas Jefferson, burned a lot of their papers, um, didn't always write things down, didn't have the drive to be honest that John Adams might have had. And so as a result, John Adams just lays it all out there and people can decide what they want about him, whereas people make assumptions about Thomas Jefferson because he doesn't tell you everything. And we're finding out more every day, but you know, he's, he was very, very careful about what he put on paper. So as a result of that, a lot of John Adams' character, characterizations that come out here are not always positive. But if we can look, first of all, at one theme that is overwhelmingly positive, it is the honest. John Adams. This is one of the first things that people note about him. It's one of the reasons that he is held up to such high esteem. And that book that I mentioned, written in 1933 by Gilbert Chenard, the title is quite simply Honest John Adams. And it's interesting, I, I read a, an Amazon review of this book when I was doing my research. And the reviewer said, John Adams is the Rodney Dangerfield of founding fathers. <laughs> he never got the respect that was due him. This book gives you a wonderful insight into the man. I highly recommend it. I just thought that was wonderful. But Gilbert Chenard talks about this honesty. And Chenard, by the way, also admired um, John Adams' way with words. And he said if he had been raised in Europe, he might have become a writer um, because he was so good at, at describing things. Well, this honest John Adams continues with um, a woman named Catherine Drinker Bowen who was a wonderful biographer. Her biographies are sometimes categorized as um, fictional biography because she makes up dialogue and scenes and so forth. But she uses primary sources. And she said, why have I chosen to write about John Adams? Because he is the brightest, 
quickest, honestest man I have met in history. That's quite a compliment for a woman who, who wrote the biographies that she did. Now also going along with this idea of honesty is integrity and doing the right thing. And in this sense, John Adams came to the forefront in the early 1960s uh, with John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage. Uh, John F. Kennedy picked several figures from American history to write about um, who had stood up and spoken truth to power, who had done the right thing even though they suffered politically. And John Adams is in that book. A whole chapter is dedicated to him and his role in uh, the Boston Massacre trials. And what I didn't know until I came here and talked to Ed Fitzgerald, God bless you, is that there was a television series made of Profiles in Courage. And they did an episode um, on John Adams. I know that it was actually screened here at one point. I'm not sure how long ago that was. Two weeks before the pandemic. Is that right? That, okay. <laughs> I knew it had to be 2020 because that's obviously an anniversary, but, but there you have it. Thank you for that. Um, and it starred David McCollum, not to be confused with David McCullough, um, who you might know from The Man from Uncle, um, more recently NCIS, and unfortunately he died just about a month ago, so he's no longer with us. I was very sad to hear this. Um, McCollum's take on John Adams is rather understated, but what comes out in this is a Jan John Adams who is struggling to stand for the law, um, who is against mob violence, but who also wants to defend the city of Boston. Um, and you see this struggle going on in, in this particular profile of courage, if you will allow me to say that. So this is another way that John Adams is sort of lifted up and used as an example for us. Um, this is a man who did the right thing because it was the right thing to do. Now, if we move into the late 60s, the late 60s into the early 70s, the next trope we see I call the deeply flawed John Adams. Um, we can also call this the obnoxious and disliked John Adams. Now, when we get to the late 60s and early 70s, I don't think I have to tell you um, what was happening in the country at this point. Um, historically, um, in the, the historian's field, one of the things that was prominent at this point was the new social history. Um, looking at, at common people and how they interacted um, during times of crisis. And this led to a need to make the Founding Fathers more human. Enter 1776. Now, this was a musical that was written by a history teacher. Um, he wrote all the songs. He wrote what was apparently a dreadful script um, until they brought in Peter Stone to improve it. And what you can see here from the original poster is this sort of goofy looking eagle who doesn't quite know what's going on at this point, um, coming out of the egg that England laid. That's uh, a line from one of the songs. And in this musical, um, there's a running joke about John Adams that no one listens to him because he's obnoxious and disliked. Um, I believe Benjamin Franklin says this the first time. He says, nobody listens to you, John. You're obnoxious and disliked. And John Adams just takes this in stride. Um, it, it runs through the musical, and it does come from a self-description that uh, John Adams provided as late as 1822, so he's looking back on his time in the Continental Congress, and he's telling a gentleman that he's writing to about how it was decided that Thomas Jefferson would write the Declaration. 
And so he goes through and he explains the dialogue that he has with Jefferson in incredible detail, which makes some scholars say, yeah, is he really remembering this? And Jefferson never quite remembered the conversation this way either. So, you know, take it in stride. But it's, it's a conversation that historians have accepted for a long time. And John Adams is saying to Thomas Jefferson, you know, I, I, I really need for you to write the declaration. And Jefferson says, well, you should write it. You, you've been screaming about it on the floor for months. You should be the one who writes it. And uh, Adams says, oh, no, 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 I can't. And Jefferson says, well, why not? And Adams says, because I'm obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. And you're quite otherwise. Okay, now again, this is in 1822. And even as McCullough points out, there were people who weren't crazy about John Adams back in 1776, but nobody called him obnoxious. Um, but the writers of 1776 thought, well, this is gold, let's just run with this. And so it becomes a running joke throughout the musical. Um, it's, it even features in one of the songs, but Mr. Adams. What's interesting about this running joke to me, though, is that there comes a moment where it becomes poignant. Because near the end of the musical, John Adams is in a crisis. Um, it looks like independence is going to be defeated. And he goes up into the bell tower again, and he has a conversation with Abigail. Um, the, the script tells you that these conversations happen in the far reaches of John Adams' mind. And this happens three times in the show, and this is the last time. And he's explaining to Abigail what the problem is. And he says at one point, and it seems that I'm obnoxious and disliked. And at that point, you just want to cry like a baby for him, because you, you can see this has really been hurting him all this time. So it's not a joke anymore for him. This trope of John Adams being obnoxious and disliked, however, doesn't go away. It's not over with 1776. It continues through several different depictions of John Adams. Um, he is in John Jake's The Rebels, and he says, you know, I'm not a popular man in that. Played once again, by the way, by William Daniels. Uh, William Daniels once said he played all the famous Adams Adamses except Abigail. Um, I'd love to see that myself. But, but it sticks, even through the HBO miniseries. And it gets to a point where it's not funny anymore. Here's why I say this. Paul Giamatti, who in many respects um, gave a brilliant performance as John Adams, worked with what the script gave him, and I'm not sure he had a full understanding of who this man was. Um, on several occasions, I heard him describe John Adams as a really weird guy. And in one interview, he said that John Adams was, and I quote, a nightmare of a guy. Now, I have to tell you, I was driving at the time when I heard this interview. And I'm screaming at the radio, going, no, Paul, no, you don't understand. Um, but that's what he said. He was a nightmare of a guy. And several years after the HBO miniseries came out, um, an acting student asked him why he thought the HBO producers chose John Adams for an HBO miniseries. So once again, it was that question, why John Adams? And Paul Giamatti said, well, you know, we know who Washington is, we know who Jefferson is, and I think the producers at HBO wanted someone who was sort of an anti-hero and someone who was notorious for being difficult. Um, by the way, Giamatti's phrasing of that was a bit more colorful, but I will spare you what he actually said. If you're interested, I will be happy to talk to you after class, okay? Um, but that sort of misunderstanding, missing the nuances of who John Adams was, makes this obnoxious and disliked trope a bit tragic for him. 
because you don't see the love he has for his wife, um, the concern he has for his children, his capacity for friendship, his sense of humor. All of that is missing in some of these depictions. So you don't get a three-dimensional John Adams the way I wish you could. Now, one other thing I've got to touch on here, and this is where Quincy comes in, in a big way, is the public John Adams. I couldn't have written this book without talking about um, the missing monument in Washington, D.C. You all know what I'm talking about, right? It's got to happen. It's not there yet. Maybe we'll get there. But John Adams predicted this. Um, he said very famously, monuments will never be erected to me. That was the working title of this book, uh, but my publishers felt differently about that title, so <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, but he says, monuments will never be erected to me, and then rather unconvincingly, he goes on to say, I want them not. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> of course he wanted monuments. Everybody wants monuments. Um, and I was asked recently, um, was he right about this? Was his prediction true? And I said, well, it depends on where you look. If you look here in the city of Quincy, it's not true at all. This whole city is a monument to John Adams. And um, it's clear in some respects that he ensured that that would happen. I mean, he, he left deeds uh, so that things would be built and that, that he would be remembered. This very building, for example, um, comes out of one of his deeds that, that he wrote. But I also have to say this city is very, very good about various monuments. From the Adams National Historical Park, and the wonderful work that Marianne Peak and her staff do to maintain the legacy of John Adams and her family. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, to Quincy Historical Society. I mean, you, you cover the entire history of Quincy, but the Adamses are right there. Thank you very much for that. To United First Parish Church, who lovingly maintain those tombs and have an active visitors program, thanks to, thanks to Bill Westland, and have one of the best presidential wreath laying ceremonies in the country, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for, for that presentation. The Hancock Adams Common. It's a beautiful space, so your city leaders are, are doing this as well. And then, the yet-to-be-built Adams Presidential Center that's, that's coming our way will be an appeal to, to public service, which would have pleased John Adams no end. In all of these ways, Quincy is making sure that this man is remembered. And that's why I love coming here. You are my people. Have I said that already? <laughs> so when it comes to statues, you know, we have this latest one at the Hancock Adams Common. And by the way, I've heard this called the Hancock Adams Common and the Adams Hancock Common. And um, so I, I have to be careful about what I call it. But what you might not know is that there are some other statues um, Elsewhere, I mean, I know that there are others here in Quincy. Um, my husband and I went trunking to Marymount Park to see the Lloyd Lilly statues um, in their new digs. So um, we enjoyed seeing those very much. But this statue here is located in Rapid City, South Dakota. <laughs> Another city that calls itself the City of Presidents because of Mount Rushmore. And in the early 2000s, they decided that it would be nice to, to remember all of the presidents. So they start putting all of these statues on street corners in Rapid City. And this is the John Adams statue. There he is on a street corner somewhere. 
I haven't been out there lately, so I haven't been able to see this, but I'll, I'll look it up at some point. And then there's this one. Oh, my laser pointers. That statue is in Bilbao, Spain, of all places. And a lot of people would say, okay, well, that's weird. What's he doing there? Um, John Adams wrote a massive volume called The Defense of the Constitutions of the United States of America. And one of the chapters was dedicated to the Basque region and how they have maintained their culture and their language and their government. And so the people about Bilbao, Spain, decided to thank him for that, and they put up this statue. Now, this is another statue that I haven't seen yet. The next time that we go to Spain, I'm looking for it because I want my picture with that statue. But of course, the, the big hole is in Washington, D.C. And it's interesting to note here that John Adams is not necessarily missing from Washington, D.C. at this point. You just have to go looking for him. For example, um, there is a monument to all the signers of the Declaration of Independence in a place I think it's called uh, Constitution Gardens. And there are all of these stones with the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So there he is, John Adams, lawyer, Braintree. Sorry about that, but in 1776 it was Braintree. But then there's this building here. This building, this rather nondescript building, is an annex to the Library of Congress. And in 1980, it was renamed the John Adams Building because, in recognition of the fact that John Adams signed the legislation that created what would become the Library of Congress. So, that's the John Adams building. And again, I have not visited this building. I don't know if there's anything else there about him. I did recently meet a woman who retired from the Library of Congress, and she worked in the John Adams building. And when she heard about my book, she was asking me about John Adams. She said, I know nothing about him. I worked in the John Adams building. I know nothing about him. She said, what did he look like? And I was taken aback. I thought everybody knew that. Uh, but she said, was he tall, short, you know, like that. So I tried to describe him as best I could to her. Um, but he's in Washington, D.C. He's just not there the way we'd like to see him there. So I don't know whether monuments to the founders, if this is something that um, is no longer possible, if the time for that has passed, I don't know. Um, all I know is that I would like to see him honored in this way. Um, I will be there at the groundbreaking, I will be there at the dedication, and I will do whatever I can to see that this happens. But I don't know, I can't predict whether this will happen. So then, has he been strangely used? Well, he might think so, <laughs> looking back on all of this. Um, this nice bust has a, a place of honor in my <coughs> office, but so does my John Adams bobblehead. <laughs> and it's very helpful when I'm trying to make a decision about something, I'll ask him and he always says yes. <laughs> it works for me. Um, musicals, HBO miniseries, um, and this is one of the novels over here, um, a book called Those Who Love and it's a novel of John and Abigail. If you'll notice that tall, lanky guy on the front cover is supposed to be John Adams. I don't think that the cover artist knew what John Adams looked like either, but there he is. And this animated figure in the middle, this is from Liberty's Kids. And John Adams was in Liberty's Kids in, in several episodes, voiced by none other than Billy Crystal. But Here's what I like about Liberty's Kids. In one of those episodes, you see John Adams writing the Constitution for the state of Massachusetts. And as far as I know, there's no other popular culture depiction in which you see him doing that. You have to go to Liberty's Kids. Don't ask me why, but there it is. So, strangely used? Maybe. So let me go back to this quote from 1797. 
John Adams said once again, I have been so strangely used in this country, so belied and so undefended, that I was determined to say some things as an appeal to posterity. Foreign nations and future times will understand them better than my enemies or my friends will own they do. As an appeal to posterity. He wants us to understand him. He wants us to remember him. And that's what I've tried to do with this book. And I'd like to think that he would be happy with what I've done. I don't know, he's John Adams, it's just really hard to tell, but I tried. And so, let me just end by saying, happy birthday, John. And thank you for everything. Thank you.